So today I'm going to talk about how we can uh, create smarter global health systems through our cell phones. But before I start talking about you know, the details of, of my pre presentation, let me do a quick uh, poll. How many of you uh, carry at least one cell phone in your pocket today? <laughs> well, that's expected. That's expected. That's the same response that I get from everyone that I present this work. But how many of you actually uh, uh, do own a microscope? Fantastic, fantastic. This is, this, is a, this is a great response because uh, it tells that some people are really uh, uh, interested in science. But how many of you then uh, do own a, a blood analyzer? Well. <laughs> so those who could not raise uh, their hands for the last two questions don't get upset because today I'm going to introduce to you a technique and a way to convert your existing cell phones in your pockets into microscopes, into blood analyzers that they could be used for something very useful. And I'll tell you how this could really change our infrastructure for global health, especially uh, in resource poor countries. So that's the theme of my talk today. So as we know, cell phones are now everywhere. We have close to 5 billion cell phone subscribers in the world. And the majority of these people are actually, believe it or not, are living in resource poor countries. So by 2015, close to 90% of the entire world population will carry at least one cell phone that's subscribed to a network. So if you combine this with the fact that our cell phones are getting better in terms of software and hardware, this existing infrastructure that is in our pockets connected to a network holds a significant promise to be utilized as a health monitoring platform. So we can really fight infectious diseases like HIV, TB, or malaria, or other food-borne diseases, water-borne diseases, using your cell phones. Imagine, for instance, that you had a technology that could convert your cell phone into a microscope, into something that can look at blood cells. Then you can potentially screen malaria. What I'm showing here is actually a blood smear. What you're looking at are blood cells. And just like uh, using a regular microscope, imagine that you could actually look at these cells using your cell phone or a device that attaches to a cell phone to do microscopy in field settings. I'm talking about in Africa where there's nothing but just a cell phone working. So then you could diagnose malaria and really literally help all these countries that are highlighted with yellow, most of which are living in resource poor countries. So the same applies for other problems that we face today, such as um, detection of ba bacteria in drinking water. It's a big problem. To give you an idea of the scale of the problem, co-infections, HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, they cause around 4 million deaths a year. If you add that to water uh, or poor drinking water related problems, that's, that number goes up to almost 6 million a year. Those diseases actually could really be helped with technologies like simple microscopes working in field settings. So that's the theme of my talk. If you look today how we do the same thing in advanced laboratories, we have gadgets that work very nicely in our labs. What I'm showing here is uh, an advanced technology that works in hospitals. UCLA's hospital, for instance, have probably you know, hundreds of these machines working in different lamps to look at blood or different bodily fluids. The problem with these advanced technologies is that they're costly, they're bulky, hard to miniaturize, and the running costs would be very high. Even if you were to donate one of these to an African village, they wouldn't be able to run this. Per test, it would be too expensive. For the same task of looking at cells, of course, for centuries, for, for more than a century, we've been using conventional microscopes that you see in here. We don't like it for the task of looking at blood cells or any bodily fluid in field settings because they're still bulky. As you can see, it's not uh, convenient to carry this around in your pocket. Uh, and they're also relatively expensive. So what I've been doing in my research group at UCLA is finding new ways to do microscopy running on a cell phone, such that we could leverage this enormous volume of cell phones in billions 
to do something much simpler in terms, of, uh, in terms of microscopy. So what you look at here are some of the prototypes that we have in our lab that can do microscopy with extremely inexpensive, cost-effective, uh, and compact units that can attach to a regular cell phone to convert it into, it into a microscope, or you can imagine for a, a cell phone that doesn't have a camera unit on it, something that can attach just like a webcam, except now this is a microscope, that can do blood analysis right there with very inexpensive components. The technology behind this is actually our invention. It's, it's, it's called Lucas. So now let me give you more on the Lucas concept and how it really can do microscopy on a simple device as, as a cell phone. The first striking property, the, the, the feature of, of Lucas technology that makes it quite different than an existing microscope is that it's lens-free. So we do microscopy without lenses. It makes it very cost-effective, compact, and lightweight. But of course, there's a question mark of how does it work? So if you go to Best Buy or any uh, digital camera store today to buy a high-end digital camera, the most expensive part that you will be paying is this front-end lens. That's what you mostly pay your money for. The same is true for conventional microscopes. A good microscope comes with these lenses which are called objective lenses, which are also expensive and, and, relatively speaking, heavy. So our platform entirely gets rid of those uh, lenses such that it becomes very compact. This microscope, for instance, is less than around 1.5 ounces. And it can do microscopy the same resolution, the same uh, image quality as you would find in a regular $1,000 microscope. At the same time, it becomes very cost-effective and looking at actually a large sample volume uh, at the same time. So without lenses, how does it work? Because we don't have these lenses that magnify images, actually we detect, we image the shadows of these cells or parasites rather than their images. So if you walk on a sunny day outside, you would see your shadow casting on, a, on, on the street. This shadow is not very interesting because we're opaque to radiation. Light cannot penetrate through us. That's why our shadows are pitch dark. But at the micron scale, at, you know, at the very small scale, like one millionth of a meter, these cells are semi-transparent to light. So if you look at their shadows, you would see that they are textured. So the cells or pathogens or bacteria, they cast a unique shadow that can be treated as the fingerprint of the cell. So we image without the use of any lenses, these shadows, and use computer algorithms to reconstruct them, to identify them, and to create images from these patterns as if you're looking through a regular microscope through a bunch of expensive lenses to give you the same image quality. So what you're looking at here is a whole blood sample, which is mostly red blood cells. So these are actually uh, shadows of these uh, red blood cells. Every now and then, if you were to focus, you would see a different shadow type. That is the shadow of, of a white blood cell. So based on these shadows, simply, you can start to count different cell types within whole blood, within urine, or other bodily fluids, and start to understand what the immunity of the patient is doing. Because different cells, like a fingerprint of the cell, cast different shadows. This type of a shadow approach is very powerful. It gives you unique s signatures per cell. However, as this density of the solution gets higher and higher, you would see clustering of cells which give you overlapping among different cells. It's just like walking on a sunny day, except now it's, if it's very crowded, then your shadow will overlap with someone else's shadow. So then it's very difficult maybe for us to kind of look at these clustered regions because all these sh shadows overlap with each other. But this is a time to realize that scientifically, actually, these shadows are uh, holograms of these cells. So you can actually take these simple looking uh, shadows and reconstruct them using simple computer codes very uh, rapidly to create an image as if you're again looking at uh, through a regular microscope, which nicely matches to a regular microscope image. These are red blood cells, and what you're looking at here is roughly speaking uh, a scale 100, one millionth of a meter uh, length scale. We can do the same thing with even uh, more dense solutions, such that we can literally take these uh, dull-looking shadows overlapping with each other and reconstruct images with sub-second 
uh, time resolution to give you whatever the microscope, the, that bulky microscope, would normally give. To summarize, we're essentially working with shadows, but at the micron scale, we're capturing them, and then the cell phone could either capture them or could send it to a simple PC station for you to get back the reconstructed or analyzed samples with very inexpensive, uh, at the same time, lightweight units attached to a cell phone, either mechanically or through a USB cable. It literally enables us to convert these billions of cell phones into something that could analyze urine, blood, sweat, sputum, or any other uh, sources like water for pathogens. So we can look at different white blood cells from their shadows, reconstruct images, just like a regular microscope would do. We can look at uh, diseases like sickle cell. This is a regular microscope. These are the shadows. You can quickly reconstruct them, and which gives you the same essential resolution that a normal microscope would give. So to, to wrap up this part, we believe that the Lucas platform, because it can literally convert these existing infrastructure uh, that we have for around cell phones into microscopes, it really holds a significant promise for various different uh, infectious diseases, including uh, tuberculosis, malaria. At the same time, it holds also um, some third, some developed world applications like looking at blood banks in extreme throughputs. Few examples that I will uh, go over is, uh, is the impact of this technology for especially extremely resource poor countries. One important problem that we have today is uh, monitoring of HIV positive patients. So most of these HIV positive patients are living in Africa. And a big problem that we face today is to monitor their immunity response. To start the therapy, we need to understand how well their immunity is doing. So, one way of looking at the immunity response of the patient is to count cells, and these are specific white blood cells. They're called CD4 lymphocytes. It's a sp specific white blood cell where HIV unfortunately attacks and their density drops. If you're healthy, you typically have a thousand of these per unit volume, like a microliter of your whole blood has a thousand of these cells. HIV positive patients unfortunately are somewhere in this range, a few hundred, and if you're really sick, you're below 100, and that's where a simple flu can kill you. That's why every few months this number should be checked, and once the therapy kicks in, that of course stabilizes about a few hundred, hopefully. One way of doing this is using a flow cytometer. Again, the running cost of this machine would be at least five to ten dollar range per test, which would not be feasible. So we've, we've validated actually our technology such that we can measure the CD4 count of these patients with simple gadgets that we can analyze using the Lucas technology. What you're looking at here with these circles are captured CD4 lymphocytes from an HIV positive patient where we look at their shadows, reconstruct them and count them to enumerate their, uh, their density to start the therapy or not. And again, this is much cheaper than a conventional flow cytometers, which again is very important because not only you have the miniaturization, but also the cost effectiveness to make a full-blown solution uh, that works in the field. Another important thing that I uh, briefly touched in my introduction was what it could enable for screening of water-related diseases. Again, it, there's uh, close to two million deaths a year because of simple diseases like uh, diseases called by Giardia or E. coli or um, or some, uh, some parvum. Once again, this technology, while it's going to impact especially telemedicine to create a smarter global health system deployed in resource poor countries, third world countries, the same technology we were pushing it to help our lives in the United States by creating new ways of looking at these cancer cells, especially before they start uh, another uh, tumor in the body through uh, detection of circulating tumor cells in our blood with extreme uh, uh, low densities. So this uh, kind of wraps up uh, my presentation, and I'd like to finally acknowledge all of my students uh, who are behind this work and our funding agencies, uh, which, uh, of course, we're very grateful. Once again, thank you for, for this kind introduction, uh, uh, invitation, and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions.